Influencing popular culture, politics, and everything in between. The local station takes you ringside as we discuss the crazy world that is professional wrestling. This is Going Ringside with the local station. Hello there, and thank you for joining us on this special On the Road edition of Going Ringside. I'm your host, Scott Johnson. We're here at River City Wrestling Con, where we are, there's some wrestling going on, you can probably hear, but we've been talking to the stars all over the place that we're going to bring you all summer long, but one star we're gonna start with tonight. That would be the legend himself, Booker T. From Harlem Heat, to WCW champion, to WWE, to the King, to announcing today for NXT. In fact, I just wrapped up talking to him. He's on the way to Las Vegas to call another NXT show. Booger T is becoming one of the greatest performers in history. So I sat down with Booker. We're also joined by AJ Francis, who you maybe knew as Top Dalla in WWE. We all sat down and talked to Booker T at a Q&A here at the River City Wrestling Con and Booker had a lot to say. So let's get to it. Here he is, the man himself, the five-time, 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 five-time WCW Heavyweight Champion. Here's Booker T. If anybody comes up here and does a spin rooney I'll give you a free autograph. <laughs> well, I'm Scott Johnson with the Going Ringside Podcast, based with Channel 4 here. We're excited to be joined by the great one himself, Booker T., yeah, we just push the button right there to talk anytime. Booker, thank you for joining us today. And of course, AJ Francis with us too. Yeah, clap for Booker, not for me. Clap for Booker. Testing, 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 testing. Yeah, yeah, okay, I got it. What up? Yeah, y'all doing? Y'all ready to do this? Let's have some fun. Let's have some fun. Booker, talk to us about what you're doing in life right now. Are you on the road and just taking a break from your announcing duties, or what's going on with you? Man, I believe actually, um, I'm on a flight. At 5.20, um, I'm heading through Houston to Las Vegas, getting ready for Battleground tomorrow night. You do not want to miss out. You do not want to get shut out. The, the card is stacked from top to bottom. Uh, Lola Vice is going to, she's going she's gonna to shake. All right, let's just say that. She's going to shake. She's going to shake it. Uh, Shayna Baszler is going to be awesome. NXT Underground match. I hate these things, man. I know, um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll boom, there it is right there. So uh, Lola Vice has really been uh, getting a lot of attention lately, we've noticed. Well, um, uh, you know, she's been getting a lot of attention, but she's really good at what she does. Um, not just shaking it, of course, but uh, in the ring, she performs at a very high level. And if you go back and watch some of her Bellator stuff, she was real um, serious as far as the, the fight game goes. She's been doing it since she was a little bitty kid. And now to see her make this transition in WWE, it's been, it's been pretty, pretty cool. And for me to be able to mentor her and give her uh, a little bit of advice as far as, you know, the, the what not to do, the, um, the, um, the psychology of the business, uh, it's been pretty cool. Me being in NXT for this last year and a half has been really cool. I was slated to be there for three months. And then I was like, man, ain't no way Wade Barrett's going to get his job back. <laughs> you can forget about it. It's been a year and a half, and it's been an awesome time. You know what's funny to me is that uh, when I was in WWE, because I live in Orlando, I would spend a lot of time going to the PC. And I was training with Lola Vice in the ring um, during open ring before she was ever on TV. And I would consistently have to tell her, like, hey, like, you don't really have to hit the hell out of me. <laughs> like, she is a striker for real. She yeah. took that <laughs> MMA style to the ring. She do not play around. She be in there really going at it. And I got a lot of respect for her because she put the work in, and she's a good friend, and I I'm very happy for her success. But what, what I want to ask you, and the question that I want to ask you is, as you know, you know, I've gone to Reality of Wrestling Row in Houston, which is – Booker's promotion in Houston. Of Make that? sure you guys Amazing. Do, do, do this right now, guys. Make sure you take your phones out mm -hmm. and subscribe to Reality of Wrestling slash YouTube. Do it! Do it, do, do it. Do it now! Do it, do it. You know why? The king is You know why? I do it for you. Uh-huh. It's great. <laughs> it's incredible. And I and I've and I've been there. It's top notch. It's the best, it's the best promotion that I've been to outside of WWE, honestly. And and I say that sincerely, and we've had this conversation before. And the cool thing that he has because of your relationship with NXT is you bring NXT talent 
to your shows. There's not a lot of other companies that get that privilege. So my question is, how do you decide who you bring from NXT to Reality of Wrestling? You know, it's all about stepping up. It's all about who's going to raise their hand and say, I want to be a part of it. I'm not going to go searching, you know, and, and trying to, you know, get guys to be a part of what I'm doing. Uh, you know, it's just like certain guys in NXT. I've been there for a year and a half, and I haven't had a conversation with them other than hi and bye. But it's been a lot of guys that I've had conversations with, um, and we network, and we study, and we do film study. And all of those guys, all of them, has risen to the top. And, and moving out of NXT and, and going to the main roster. Um, tonight, I have a show in Houston, and uh, Alexis King is gonna be there. He came uh, a couple of months ago, and he's back again just because he wanted to you know, have the experience, and uh, as well as his girl friend is gonna be there uh, as well. So it, it's about who wanna step up at Reality Arresting, who want the knowledge um, to make it to that next level, because I, I'm, I, I'm from the old school. But, but I feel like I'm a hybrid at the same time. I don't think like an old guy, just because I have a lot of young people around me. My partner on my radio show, he started with me when he was 18 years old, and now he's 32, and now he has his own show. My, and it my, helps that you're yeah. just cool. Yeah, yeah, my, that keeps you young. Uh, exactly. <laughs> oh, you look at me, look at me. I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> it's all about uh, you know staying young and, and staying relevant, and sometimes it take you know the young guys, you know, to, like like Bad Bunny writing a song about me, keeping me relevant. So now, I Booker, that. I want to. You said old school, which is my fandom. Yeah. So I want to go a little old school on you. <laughs> How did you and Stevie Ray start back way back when in the Harlem Heat days when it first started? How were you guys brought in? You know, my brother always wanted to be a professional wrestler. He, um, you know, watched it as a kid. He you know, emulated the wrestlers. He was actually working out when he was like 16 years old. Remember he had this thing he ordered off, offline. Back then, offline was totally different than it was today. <laughs> uh, but it was called a bull worker, <laughs> you know? And he used to be working with that thing like crazy. But he knew a guy um, that opened a wrestling school by the name of Ivan Pusky, WWE Hall of Famer. Um, he opened a school back in 1990, and my brother went to the school. And, and he actually, he asked me if I wanted to go to the school as well. The school was $3,000. It was an eight-week course. Eight weeks. Eight weeks. And um, Eight I, weeks will make you a wrestler. Exactly. <laughs> eight, eight weeks, you, they give you a little certificate that says you're a professional wrestler. It, it seemed to work. <laughs> no, no, but that's not the way it really works. It, but, it's not. But, <laughs> no, but it got my foot in the door, you know, and I was willing to do anything to get my foot in the door. But I didn't have the money to um, go to the wrestling school, but I was working for a guy, and he sponsored me to go to the wrestling school. His name is Bruce Kasarch, and I, I, owe, I owe him everything. And still to this day, we still talk. Um, but he was the uh, reason I was able to go to the wrestling school. And when I went um, for the first time, uh, it was like deja vu. It seemed like I had been there before. It seemed like, man, it's, it's not you know that hard for me at all. And it became uh, something that was relatively easy for me to pick up from the psychology side. And I think it was just from the way I came up watching so many movies and skipping school. and. <laughs> <laughs> going, going downtown and you know watching those old karate movies and stuff. It prepared me for professional wrestling, but that's how we got in. And then eventually, eight, seven or eight years later, WCW folds, and you wind up moving into the all new territory. Yeah. And facing off in supermarkets with guys <laughs> in some of the more iconic <laughs> moments of all time. Oh man, it, it was uh, you know in WCW I was a wrestler, um, and then when I came to WWE I had to be. Uh, become a performer, entertainer, um, you know, character building. And for me, I was I was ready for that challenge. I, I always wanted to see exactly how far I could go as an entertainer. The wrestling side was, was easy. It really was. And then to actually have to feel what it means to go out to make people laugh, uh, you know, create, you know, iconic scenes like with Goldust, you know, um, the boogeyman, uh, you know, um, Stone Cold in the grocery store. You know, those moments for me are the moments that people, People remember, of course, they remember a few of my matches, but I think people remember most most of my moments. I think more than anything. So I think to be um, well rounded in this business is something that you got to have to make it to the next level. Yeah, and I, I I appreciate you as a just as a man because I was just like one of them. I was a fan. I would come to the shows, and ever since the day we met, you've been nothing but real. You've been nothing but a genuine person, putting people on game, not just me. And I want to give you your flowers for that. But this is 
a Q and A. Thanks to the people at Fair. Oh yeah, it's bad. It's a thanks to the people at Fair and Fair. <laughs> we want to give you guys a chance to ask any questions you have for Booker T. So uh, right there in the front, what's your question? Go ahead. What up, man? Yep, yep. Beautiful impersonation. Who, for our TV viewers who wants to know who from WCW would they have brought into WWE? Or do, yeah. Well, they they brought a, they brought the guy in, um, but the guy I think that really didn't get a chance to have his full run in WWE that I would have really loved to see him get a run, and because I work with him and I know how good he really was um, when he came to WWE. You know, they, he did some crazy stuff, but that would be Perry Saturn. Perry Saturn, man, he was so freaking good, man. He was such a hell of a worker, and I remember working him one night. Um, I worked Rick Martel, and I worked Perry Saturn the same night, back to back. And uh, I remember Perry Saturn, he did the moonsault off the second rope and the backflip, and his, his knee brace caught me right on the jaw. Boom, and I went down, and I was out. He goes, you okay? I go, yeah, I'm okay. He go to pick me up, and my legs didn't move. <laughs> I go, I'm not okay. Let's <laughs> just stay here for a bit. <laughs> you know, but Perry Sadden was so freaking good, and I just wish he would have got a better run. And yeah. I definitely put a lot of my cousins in the ring of Saturn, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Go ahead. Well, all the accent and changing my, uh, you know, <laughs> accent, well, that was all me. Um, I was just being stupid. And uh, I always wanted to talk, you know, with a British accent, you know. Anyway. You're not from the UK? <laughs> 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 and, uh, but I had uh, some good writers um, as well that was writing some good stuff. I remember uh, one uh, thing they had wrote for me was Balderdash. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? But, it's, but it sounds good. Did William Regal give you any ideas? <laughs> no, I mean, no, nobody gave me any ideas. I feel like um, the King character was something that I, I captured. It's something that I, I took and, and made it my own. Um, I don't think the King character was actually for me to be that endeared this you know far after the you know the king character was done by me um, i took that character i made that character i broke the mold when i finished that character i was the only king throughout the history of the king of the ring tournament to to go to go on to become the heavyweight champion and rule the smackdown kingdom to now when the king of the ring tournament is granted a championship title shot I did it with an iron fist. I ruled SmackDown when I did it. And, 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 I, and I say this, um, you know, with all sincerity, I was the best damn king in the history of the King of the Ring. Amen. There you go. Amen. I really, I really Let's get that. a hear here for King Booker. <laughs> <laughs> Question in the back, and I may repeat it for our TV viewers. Go ahead. Asking about oh, gold dust man. and keeping it together. You know, I've come, I come from the era uh, where it was a show called Cabernet. And uh, it was these two characters on there. Uh, one name was Tim Conway and Harvey Carmen. And they used to have these scenes to where the scenes were so funny that they couldn't stop from laughing themselves live on television. And that's the way I felt with gold dust. Uh, we were creating some great, great magic. I wanted to laugh so much you were doing all of those scenes with Gold Dust. Uh, but that's what made it uh that's what made it work. Um Gold Dust and I, we were really, really good friends from WCW. Um I had a really, really good, great camaraderie with with his dad, Dusty. You know, of course, you know, I was I did the last angle, you know, of my career on television with, with Cody. You know what I mean? So I think I just think it was the uh, being so close is what made Goldust and Booker T really work, as well as 
That time with Gold Dust, it was like a vacation uh, because we would come to work and we would just have vignettes. We didn't have to, have to wrestle or anything. We would just come and just act stupid. And I remember Goldie and I, we was in the locker room one day and it was just him and I, and we were just laughing. And we was like, man, they actually pay us to do this. Are you kidding me? You know, so it was the greatest time uh, in my career working with Goldie. Go ahead. Uh, Megan, what are you struggling about your day delivery? Yeah. And you actually had these same exact dancers that DJ did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Petey Williams, right here he is, yeah. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> now that we're in public, I want to ask, I wanna, are you cool with me stealing that and doing it at TNA? Oh, man, most definitely, man. That's something I always wanted to yeah, do. It. That's on camera. Oh, man, man, it's crazy. Like AJ Francis. <laughs> Uh, for the rest of this year in NXT, uh, or oh, um, you know it, the easy uh, the easy answer is uh, Trick Williams, you know. But 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 I'm not gonna go with Trick, uh, just because you know he yeah, he's a champion already. Um, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about the next talent, uh, the next uh, group of talent that's that I got my eye on, and you know we got that that uh, that ladder match, you know, for the North American Women's Championship coming up. Tomorrow, and I watch Soul Ruka, and I'm saying, man, she's man, she's a star. She's man. incredible, man. She's a star, and she's she's learned and she's picked it up so quick, and, and that's what I look at as far as you know the learning curve. So Soul is definitely gonna snatch a lot of souls uh, throughout the remainder of 24. So just keep your eye on her. Yeah. In the back, go ahead. To the side. To the side. You know that's 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 a good question. You know, um, he asked, why but, but, doesn't but, Harlem Heat get mentioned as one of the but, greatest? But but I, but I look at it a little bit different too. I look at it a little bit different. Um, in, in in WCW, of course, we was great. Um, did we get the props we, we should have got? Maybe not, but we set the record as far as uh, being the greatest tag team. So nobody can take that away from us. We is it is it partly because of your single success? Do you think? You know, perhaps, but I think a lot of it is because Harlem Heat never work one day in the WWE. I think yeah. that's got a lot to do with it, but we were a great enough tag team to where I got two Hall of Fame rings. And Talk one, about is, it. <laughs> one is for being, you know, one of the greatest tag teams of all times, and one is for being one of the, you know, greatest singles wrestlers of all time. So I think that uh, speaks volume. I think that answers all my questions. And the flame gear is iconic. Uh, yes, most definitely. The flame yes. gear is <laughs> iconic. Have either of you yeah, been to Harlem? Or from Harlem. When I was a kid, I could not believe when I found out y'all wasn't from Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what you mean they're not from Harlem? They're the Harlem Heat. It sounded cooler than Houston Heat. <laughs> it is. In the back. In the back. Uh, you know what? Stone Cold and I, we were just working. We were just doing our job that day. That day um, more than 20 years ago, we didn't think it was going to be something that was going to be iconic and people going to be thinking, you know, it was one of the greatest moments in the history of wrestling. Um, it, it, it's called a payoff in the business. And uh, when, 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 when it comes to that time, Stone Cold Steve Austin had been chasing me forever, so it was his moment. It was my moment to make it his moment. Weren't you playing uh, bingo with a number of senior citizens before he finally <laughs> caught you? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, I mean, we was in a church. He chased me into a confessional and everything. Uh, but as well as, I, you know, I jumped on him. You know, that was the first thing I did when I came into WWE was, you know, take out Stone Cold Steve Austin. So it was his moment, and it was um, great having that moment, giving him that moment. I watched that for the first time two months ago. I had never watched the grocery store scene all these years. I had seen clips of it, you know, and people would always come up to me and say, man, your best match I've ever seen was you and Stone Cold in the grocery store. And I'm <laughs> like, what the hell are you talking about? I've had thousands of matches, you know, but when I watched it, I watched it from the beginning to the end and literally 
I cried real tears of laughter from the beginning to the end. And, and I go, now I really see why people really like this so much because it was, it was so stupid. Was the grocery store manager okay with it? $15,000 worth of damage. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, he got a check. <laughs> he might have tacked on an extra five, too, you know. So he probably was happy, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah, seriously. In the back, back here in the back with the hat up. Wants to know about legendary promoter Paul Bosch's ring. Oh man, this ring right here means a lot to me. Uh, Paul Bosch's wife, you know, Pat. She wanted this ring to go to someone who, who represented Houston, and uh, she chose me, which was uh, which was a great honor. But for me, um, I was a kid who grew up in Houston, and I watched Paul Bosch uh, for so many years, um, helped so many young people. Um, he used to have a saying, he used to work with this group called the Progressive Amateur Boxing Association. And his slogan was, a kid can't open a knife or fire a gun with boxing gloves on. Ah, oh, it was just so iconic. And um, I remember that to this day. Um, he was the founder of the Boys and Girls Club in Houston when I was a kid. And I admired him. I admired Paul Bosch. I never got a chance to meet him. And then uh, when I did grow up and become a professional wrestler, I said, I'm going to be Paul Bosch. I'm gonna represent Houston just like Paul Bosch. Now I have a wrestling school, have a wrestling promotion, have a television show which is on Channel 39 which starts next month at 10 p.m. the same time on Saturday night that his show ran on. So I think Paul Bosch up there right now is watching over me and making all this happen. I love Paul Bosch, thank you for everything. Over there. Yeah, the jump from Ebony Strand, of, of course, um, coming from the Global Wrestling Federation to WCW, uh, they they uh, they wanted to call us the Shy Town Heat. <laughs> we was like, man, it's too damn cold <laughs> in Chicago to be the Shy Town Heat, even though they get cold in Harlem. It sounds cool, uh, but now Dusty was a big part in uh, the um, Harlem Heat thing. Um, our names were Kane and Cole in the beginning, and. You know, we went to Dusty and say, man, we're not feeling it, man. You know, can we go back to Booker T and Stevie Ray? And they granted that. But um, I think Dusty was the most instrumental person as far as um, creating the Harlem Heat thing. Um, the Sister Sherry thing, I really think, is the, what I call the legitimizer that really kicked Harlem Heat off and took it to the next level. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no. I had a, a saying. My brother and I, we were on television and global for two years, 18 months. And um, I never did an independent show when, when, you know, or anything like that. I said, somebody's going to call us because we just that damn good. You was right. And that's what happened. And, we, and that's, that's exactly what happened. 18 months in the Global Wrestling Federation. One night we got a phone call at the Sportatorium, and it was Sid Vicious. And he said, how would you guys like to come to WCW? And boom, the rest was history. Ma'am? What up? What up? <laughs> for life, for life. That's about a three to four hour warm up these days, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Best, uh, the best person that's done, done the spin around is the guy that was sitting right next to me, uh, was Diva. Diva did a, a pretty damn good spin around back in the day. I know he can't do it now. How did you come uh, up with the name? I didn't come up with the name. Uh, Chris Jericho came up with the name. Really? Yeah, yeah. Chris Jericho actually came up with the name Spin Rooney, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. I, I, no, I think they just dropped the ball on that. Um, and I, I never knew who it was either. I, I, I'm 
not sure who it was. I, I never, I, but I do remember that. Yeah. You said something that's interesting when he said 2003. You said you don't remember. Is there a lot of stuff that just fades into the background? Well, you got to realize you know, when he when you got a thousand matches, yeah, yeah. and just as many backstage segments, it's a lot to log back here. Plus a whole life before wrestling. A lot of it I didn't even try to remember. You know, because no, because it, it wasn't for me. It might have been an angle for somebody else, and I was just playing a role. Um, you know, um, even you know, like the, a lot of my big matches, I never really thought about the memory for myself. I thought about the memory for you guys. Uh, for you know, you know, I come to a cut and you remind me about it. Ah, oh, yeah, I remember that. Then we'll talk about it. But for me, um, I was thinking about the performance. I was thinking about the fans and how they were feeling, and hopefully they felt that same way when they were on their way home. You know, and thinking about getting to the next show that I was going to be at. So for me, um, it was always, it was just work. It was just work. A lot of it was just work. Most of it was, 85% of it was just work. Hand on right here. Right here, white hat. White hat, yeah. Final days of WCW, that oh, new man. documentary. Yeah, yeah. Um, the final days of WCW, I, I can see the, um, the, the ship sinking. Um, uh, but but for me, um, I had seen death in my life too. You know, I had lost my mother and my father, so I knew nothing lasts forever. Um, and I, I didn't have, I, I didn't feel like I was holding um, to WCW or anything like that. I had a great run; it was great. Um, but when the time came uh, to make the switch to WWF, at that time, I was ready. Uh, to make the switch because I wanted to test myself. I wanted to see exactly how good I was. I wanted to work against the best wrestlers in the world. I, I used to tell the guys at WCW, I used to say, man, I'm, I'm top five worker in the world, anywhere, you know? And they go, what, what number are you? It doesn't matter, you know? I just know <laughs> I'm somewhere in there, you know? But I wanted to test myself against the WWF guys. I had tested myself against the WCW guys. But the WWF guys, they, they, they were like, you know, the elitist. And I wanted to see it, it, just how good I really was and if I could make it in that environment. And man, um, 22 years later, pretty much, I'm still here, man. I'm still working for the company. The first feud that you're overlooking when you got to WWE is The Rock. You and The Rock, yeah, have quite yeah. a long program together. You know, but I don't even remember the program with The Rock. Honestly, I don't even remember it. I, I don't even remember it all. You know, because there again, I had to think about making it in the WWE, you know, he was like their golden boy. Um, so I had to come in and make sure my performance was right. And working with The Rock, that was a chore <laughs> because he was very, very meticulous. Everything had to be a certain way. So I say, how, how am I gonna make, um, you know, The Rock look better than anybody else, you know, has made him look? Um, cut that damn phone off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> The hell are you thinking? We in church. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, nah, I was thinking about you know all my P's and Q's. Uh, I was thinking about going out and performing at the best um, level I possibly could. And I and I think about it and, you know um, that way um, just because it's always about you know you know the here and now. Um, but I listen to the Rock and the way he described it. He go, man. You know, working with Booker T was awesome, man. Booker was, you know, one of the best athletes I've ever worked in the ring with. Man, we had such a great match. You know, then I have to go back and look at it. And I go, man, I, let me go look at this match, you know. Because there again, I was just thinking about the work uh, more than anything. Still to this day, even doing the commentary, I'm just thinking about the work. I'm not thinking about me. I'm thinking about, there again, if no bread, no water, just me. Everybody know that's Braun Breaker. You know, you know, the stuff with Trick Williams, you know, the ad-libs. Everybody know that's for Trick Williams, you know, the... You know, J.D. McDonough, that number one stunner. Everybody know that's about him. That's for him to take, to have something to take away, you know, and, and you know, you know, uh, bounce off of it. So, nah, man, it's all about the young guys. Uh, dreadlock. What up? No, I did not. Um, just because I'm, I'm not thinking about it, uh, for me, I'm just having fun. Um, I didn't know it was going to catch on until the next week when we came into the arena and uh, everybody in the arena was saying the ad libs verbatim. And I go, oh, I'm shaggy, shaggy, quack, quack. Here we go. <laughs> we got another one, another one. You know, but uh, it's, I think it's about having fun more than anything. Wrestling, you know, especially the NHT brand, if you're watching it and if you're listening to me and we're having fun, we're winning. And 
and I think right now um, NXT is hot. Everybody is um, geared to going out and performing and performing to try to make it to that next level. And if I can have any any part in these guys making it to the next level, you know, I'm gonna have some fun. Contracts will be coming up here pretty soon, and you know, we <laughs> get a little bit, you know, like like sexy red, shake it real fast. Get a little more. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that uh, the, the ad libs with uh, Trick because I remember I didn't see the episode, but um, the video of it was posted by NXT on Twitter, and I watched the video, and it had so much love, and people were so over. It was so over the first time you did it. I said he gonna have to do that every single week. That's the first thing I thought of, and now you you do it every time you come out. It's great. Now it's fun, man. Uh, but then again, it's for Trick. And then when Trick came out, he goes, "I like it." <laughs> I was like, I'm like, all right, it's yours now, bro. But now, nah, man, that's what's so fun about uh, working in NXT. Uh, I didn't think I was gonna be having this much fun at this stage of my career. But uh, man, like I say, I, I leave on a flight at 5:20 going to Vegas, and I can't wait to get to Vegas to Battleground tomorrow. I, I got a question for you too, like, because yeah. it happened. It's happened in my career as well, and I want to know one for you, like with the Trick Williams thing. It was just something you did offhand that caught on immediately. What else is something like that that's happened in your career where it just, you didn't expect it to take off the way that it did and it just took off? You know, it's, it's, it's so many of those moments, man. It's so many of those moments. It's like when I first started in the business in WCW and I used to come out and raise the roof. And then I, you know, and I look at, yeah. I look at, I look at Jey Uso right now doing the same thing I did. He's doing the same thing I did, the same exact thing. He just changed it, <laughs> you know. And um, it's like it's that kind of stuff, you know. The spin a Rooney, uh, the first time I did it in the ring, you know, it, it caught on, and and it caught on to the point to where it changed the whole narrative of the way people looked at me just from doing one freaking move, the spin a Rooney, you know. And it's not even really a move. And it's not a move. It's not to hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> just to have a little fun <laughs> in between time. But um, no, it's, it's been so many of those moments in my career. And that's why I say it's, it's been like deja vu, man. It seems like I've been in this life before, even now doing the commentating. Um, this is something that was foreseen way before it ever happened because way back in the day in WCW, even in WWE, we, used to, we would go overseas and it a, a small little box, a little monitor, we would be watching the matches. And the matches would be going on, and I would sit in front of that monitor, and I would entertain all of the wrestlers, and I would change the guys' names, I would change their finishing moves, and I would call commentary in the back, and everybody would be so entertained. And then for them to come to me and go, hey, Book, you, you want to do commentating? I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I don't have a journalism uh, background, but it goes to show you can do anything that you want to do in this life. If you put your mind to it, if you put put in the work, just to give you guys a um, just a little tidbit, I, uh, I started doing radio eight years ago, and I never thought I could do radio or anything like that. But somebody said, "Try it." So if someone uh, you, you know, find yourself in a position, guys, just do it, just try it. I tried it, and now you know my my radio sh radio show is on ESPN, um, and I'm getting ready to go national here pretty soon, and and. Guys, you can do anything you want to if you put your mind. I'm a kid who didn't finish high school. If you guys know anything about my book, From Prison to Promise, you know, I served time. Um, but there is light at the end of the tunnel, guys. You can do anything you want in this life if you just put in the work, seriously. Uh, in yellow shirt right there, go ahead. Mosey, Mussy, Mussy. Well, of course, the uh, best of seven with Benoit and I is 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 like highlight stuff, you know. My stuff that I did, Bret Hart, is really really good. Stuff with Rick Martel um, is really good. Stuff that I did with Rey Mysterio, um, you know, when I won the world title, man. You can go back and watch that match with Ray and I. It was a, it's a highlight reel for a yes, young, it is. young person trying to get into the business. Is it ever frustrating that you'll have these just amazing matches and then there are certain things that are remembered that you didn't view as highly, like maybe, you know, the supermarket? Oh, or no, no. All of, it, all of it runs together. 
Um, I don't, you know, it's the, it's, that's the Fed, you know what I mean? And, and that's for their memory. Uh, but I don't, it's just like people say, you know, talk about WrestleMania 19. They, they wanted me to win that match so bad against Triple H. And I, and I appreciate that from the fans so much. But for me, I think about the check. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, hey, I'm, I'm saying, I appreciate it, you know what I mean? But that check was the biggest check I ever got. We're coming from a, uh, a kid in South Park, Texas, who, uh, you know, the job that I had before I got in the restaurant business, I was making $15,000 a year. And I had an apartment. They gave me an apartment to go along with it. So you think I'm going to complain about losing that match when I got a check like that? Come on, man. Wake up. You know, it's professional wrestling. But uh, it's always been about taking care of my family at the end of the day. Thank That's you, it. Booker, man. I know you got a flight to catch. Yep. Well, I know we got to get out of here. We got time for one more question. Thank you to people at Fur and Fur for having us, you know, have this Q&A today. We got one more question. Little man in the back. Booker picks. Care of me. Little, Little man, man in the back. In the back. Top five rappers. Great question. Top five rappers. Man. <laughs> you know, you know I'm old school, man. I'm old school. And of course I, I gotta start with Pac. Um just Good because, choice. I mean just because he was a real poet, you know, and, and, and it's hard for me to talk about these guys today um like they like like they're real poets. Deal. DMX was a real poet, you know what I mean? That dude could talk to you and make you feel like you was in church um, and then be spitting you know, knowledge to you from a lyrical perspective at the same time. Um, I look at a Nas, you know, uh, who was there, again, another guy who was, you know, preaching to you and, and really trying to give it to you from a certain perspective. You know, I even put ludicrous on that list. Luda. Just, no, I mean, because, no, for real. I mean, Luda, you, that dude don't get enough credit, man. He, he don't. don't get as, as much credit um, as, as he should. Um, and then, you know, if I did have to put one of these new school guys on, on, on the list, it'll be Drake. Um, just because, you know, that dude has done so much in such a short amount of time. I mean. Most yeah. number ones ever. Boom. You know what I mean? That right there speaks, speaks volume. Um, but uh, uh, there again, um, I, I, I wish the um, rap game um, would have evolved a whole lot more than it have um, up to this point. I, I can't say that. Well, Booker T brought to you by Farrah and Farrah. Booker, thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get a hip hip hooray for King guys, Booker. Man. Hip hip. Hip hip. <laughs> hip hip. <laughs> Yeah. Appreciate you guys, man. I'm out of here. So I was so excited to have Booker come on the show with us. I appreciate AJ Francis. You knew better as Top Dollar helping us out there with the interview. He'll be with us a few more times in coming months. We have a lot of great interviews of the top stars on the planet. We're just going to start with Booker, and it just gets just as exciting from here. So stick with us all summer long. Going ringside is the place to be for the stars. Thanks for joining us at River City Wrestling Con. I'm Scott Johnson. We'll see you back here next time. This has been Going Ringside with the local station. Brought to you every Wednesday on your favorite podcast player. On New Sport Jacks Plus, as well as the New Sport Jacks YouTube channel.